Hey everyone, time for this week's Q&A. Just a quick reminder, uh, this is not medical advice and do your own research. Let's get started. So this was a pre-submitted question. Why is it that I can tolerate some hard cheese and butter with minor flatulence, but heavy cream, sour cream, and cream cheese will give me all the time or make it worse? Um, so that's a good question. Uh, different dairy products will have different levels of lactose Toast, which is the sugar that we need lactase to digest and this is where most people have that have dairy intolerance uh, struggle is they're not making enough lactase to digest the lactose in the dairy this could be because they have a really inflamed intestine small intestine um, you also need thyroid hormone and progesterone um, etc etc so you know, you probably don't have the raw materials or something's inflamed and irritated that is not allowing you to digest the lactose in the more lactose-containing foods, dairy foods. So getting your body to make more lactase is, you know, definitely a process. Uh, it doesn't have to be super hard or complicated, but we need to figure out exactly what foods are potentially inflaming you, as well as figure out if you have the other raw materials to help you make that enzyme. Um, but in the meantime, you know, I'd also be curious to see how much of these uh, higher lactose containing foods are you eating all at once? Is it just like, are you eating gobs and gobs of them? Or is it just a little bit that makes you um, sicker? So, you know, kind of easy as you start to ease back into dairy, if you've cut it out for a long time, this is what most people ha is happening to them. Um, you have to go slow and low. So I would see if smaller quantities make a difference and then, um, you know, look at all those other raw <laughs> materials and other components that are really important for lactase um, and, and try to go from there. Another pre-submitted question, um, any tips for overcoming glutamate sensitivity? Um, yeah, so glutamate is a necessary protein. It's a neurotransmitter and it actually usually exists as glutamic acid. So there's synthetic glutamic acid, which is monosodium glutamate, and that's MSG, and a lot of people are very sensitive to this. Um, that also chelates copper, it's a, <laughs> so you want to be careful with um, any like seasonings that have this. Um, but there's also naturally occurring uh, glutamic acid as well uh, from like processed proteins, and processed proteins can even be something like collagen or gelatin that are hydrolyzed, even if high quality, there's some just naturally occurring glutamic acid that just gets created. So some people can also have sensitivity to this. So I would say, you know, probably stray away from those more processed versions of the proteins and see if you could do okay with like something like bone broth or maybe a more naturally, naturally occurring glutamate food um, and see how you fare on that because, you know, definitely the hydrolyzation of protein can create these kind of like byproducts um, that our body might be more sensitive to or increase levels of things that we might be more sensitive to. Um, you know, the metabolism has a lot to do with it, uh, B vitamins, uh, hormone levels like progesterone, thyroid. So it's really about, you know, if, it, if you're sensitive to it now, you it's not, that doesn't mean you're always going to be sensitive to it. Um, but if it's causing you any kind of distress in the body, remove it for now and test those natural, you know, whole food <laughs> versions and still, you know, it's okay if it doesn't work for you now. Um, you can try again when you know your, your health is a little more in, in shape. So um, that's kind of what I would recommend. <clears throat> so the, the reason that copper toxicity exists is because it's not bound to um, the right copper protein. So copper needs to be bound to ceruloplasmin to be activated. Uh, otherwise, copper itself is not bioavailable, and the level of ceruloplasmin in the blood should be 90%. So when we have an excess of iron or you know, a lack of retinol, or we're taking supplements that um, cause uh, ceruloplasmin to kind of like squirt out copper and not work correctly. Um, that's kind of the best way I can describe that. It, we may have copper toxicity, but what are we gonna do about it? We have to make it bioavailable if we have unbound copper. So, you know, con the sort of like alternative communities way of addressing this is like, oh, let's take zeolite 
or ooh, let's um, let's take uh, manganese. And like, <laughs> I've seen people that have taken these, uh, you know, substances, and they get super effed up, super super effed up. They might feel better temporarily, but like in the long run, it's really not good. So the idea is not to like, oh, let me get all this copper out of my body. It's like, let me actually allow, uh, get the right cofactors that my body needs to make copper bioavailable so it can run correctly. Uh, copper toxicity is really nothing more than copper dysregulation. And so we need to fix the dysregulation. It's not about like, let me get all this copper out of my, out of my body. It's about how can I help my body use it correctly. So I hope that helps. How was your day? Uh, my day was good, thanks for asking. Uh, it's been really busy the last couple weeks. Honestly, it's been really busy just like the past couple of months. <laughs> um, but uh, with my move and everything, it's just been really hard. But the Preconception PT and I have been working really hard to bring you great content. Like we released the Cycle Literacy Guide early this week. Um, if you haven't grabbed your copy, definitely check out the link in my bio. It's a really helpful way to kind of figure out how to support yourself throughout the different phases of your cycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, we're working really hard on the course itself, too, our upcoming course on preconception. Um, I have a bunch of podcasts coming out, too. Um, it's been podcast after podcast, I feel like, the past couple weeks, and um, which is really awesome. I'm really excited. I love, I love doing those. And um, yeah, um, I'm doing a story later this week, actually, on... Um, a prenatal you guys had questions about. It just took a long time for the company to get back to me with the sources of the nutrients, but I finally have them. So stay tuned for that later this week. Um, but yeah, otherwise I'm looking forward to spending time with my family next week. Uh, so it should be fun. How often do you recommend men donate blood? Um, I usually recommend once every quarter, but that said, there's usually a foundation building period that I go with through every through with every client um, and it can take anywhere from like six to eight months maybe a little less maybe a little more depending on their situation um, and you know if all goes well in the first donation then every quarter after that is really great um, you know that's it's really uh, excellent for helping restart the iron recycling system um, and yeah I'm gonna do a post on um, maybe why you don't feel so good after donating blood, and this is kind of like an indication that you need to build more of a foundation, but um, more to come on that topic in the future. Thoughts on food-grade diatomaceous earth for killing parasites and as a silica supplement? So yeah, I actually like diatomaceous earth. I use it in my practice. Um, the only thing about it is like, you can use diatomaceous earth, but you have to focus on the top down. So. Why do we have this issue anyway? If we have an issue at all, you know, it can be taken as just like a silica supplement. Um, but if you're specifically using it to kill parasites, why do you have parasites in the first place? It's likely that you're a weak uh, host. So you have to increase your resilience uh, while taking it. Otherwise, those parasites are just going to come back. Like, you know, if you don't fix the machine, you can, the machine's going to break again. So you have to focus on the foundations. Honestly, that's way more important than taking something like diatomaceous earth. So some food for thought. I have vitamin E, Sun E 400 from now, derived from sunflower oil, but added in is rice bran oil. Is it okay? Um, I'm not sure how I feel about rice bran oil, although sunflower oil is fine. Um, I prefer rice bran, like stabilized rice bran, or like a wheat, high quality wheat germ oil. Um, it probably wouldn't be my first choice vitamin E. I much prefer Mitolife or like Swanson's or um, there's a couple more that I like, but I cannot remember right now. So yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that. I probably wouldn't take that. I think this is a two part question. Um, so maybe a silly question, but does how much you nurse impact how depleted you can be? Um, one to three times a day versus on-demand nursing or is lactating itself depleting? Um, so it's not necessarily like nursing, although nursing can increase your milk production, but like it's about how much milk you are making. And so, um, you know, nursing, like I said, can increase your milk production. Um, nursing less can decrease your milk production, but really what's depleting is 
your milk production itself. So how much volume are you making? Um, and so if we're making a lot of milk, we're nursing a lot, um, by default, we're going to need a lot more nutrients than if we were not nursing or nursing just a little bit. Um, so I hope that makes sense. Is it possible to have too much magnesium? Um, so yeah, it actually is possible, although it's very rare. <laughs> um, you would know if you started getting the poops, uh, like uh, not solid, probably diarrhea poops uh, from taking your magnesium. Um, you know, it is important to, that said, it is important to be cautious around magnesium because if your other minerals are very depleted, it can have a more of like a stressful reaction, um, a very detoxifying reaction that your body may not be ready for. So it's really important to make sure other minerals are um, up to par before you start supplementing magnesium, especially if you take a significant amount. So if you're not feeling that great on your magnesium supplement, that could be why. Um, so it just depends on like, you know, why you're asking this question, but hope that helps. Adenomyosis, how to make periods less painful. Um, so I'm sorry you're going through that. That really sucks. Um, I know that they're not the same, but I recently did a post on endometriosis. And I think that a lot of the tips from that post would also apply in this case and potentially help. Um, so I would go check that out. Um, and really it revolves around reducing um, estrogen or you know exposure to estrogen through uh, our daily lives and food. So xenoestrogens, phytoestrogens, and really reducing the stress on the body because when we're stressed, our body produces more estrogen as well. Um, I do believe that these two conditions can be very estrogen driven because uh, estrogen is uh, a growth and proliferation hormone. Um, so, to reduce the stress, um, reducing stress will also reduce our estrogen reaction, estrogen production, and hopefully help you out. Best eggs to buy, soy free. Um, so yeah, best eggs to buy are going to be pasture raised. Um, I would definitely beware of like the cage free, organic, like greenwashing that uh, you see a lot at the supermarket. It's always pasture raised, um, cage free. They still are cage-free, but will be very cramped most of the time in very tight quarters, and it, they're probably not eating their natural diet anyway. But pasture-raised, they get to graze on grass and bugs and like eat their natural diet, what they're supposed to be eating. Granted, you know, a lot of chickens still won't be fed their natural diet, but that said, soy-free is definitely a great way to go if you can get pasture-raised soy-free. Um, that's really good because soy is... Uh, being used to fatten them up and those their fat will also have uh, polyunsaturated fats and that'll get in the eggs as well so so that said you know uh, supplementing with feed is still pretty common even if pasture raising but um, pasture raised is my number one um, definitely you know soy free or not you can sometimes they don't write it on the carton or they don't advertise it but definitely see if you can find out if it's soy free um, and then organic is also my other kind of like uh, factor. So pasture raised, but if you can get pasture raised and organic, um, that's awesome. What does a trapped bubbly feeling in the upper chest and throat after a meal mean? So this sounds like indigestion and it usually happens because our stomach acid is not acidic enough to properly allow the rest of the digestive process take place. Um, so think of the digestive system as like an assembly line. And if something goes wrong up the chain, it's going to, you know, kind of ex have problems down the chain. So that's kind of what we're seeing there. It's like it's not acidic enough, so it can't move down the chain properly. Um, so, you know, I'd be curious to know why that's happening. Usually it has to do with stress and stress can be so many things. So are you eating in front of a TV? Are you, you know, are you distracted while you're eating? Um, are you, uh, you know, how are you living your life throughout the day? Are you able to get from a fight or flight state into a rest and digest state? Because that's what we need to be in when we're eating. Also, do you have the right cofactors to create stomach acid? Are you eating a plant-based diet? Um, because you're definitely going to be missing the cofactors you need to create proper stomach acid. Um, so I'd go check out my post called 
the truth about stomach acid, it's a teal post and it did it a long time ago. Um, and it has a lot of tips on, uh, you know, why your stomach acid could be low and other causes that I didn't talk about, but also like how to increase stomach acid. So go check that out. Hopefully that helps. Sudden onset of epilepsy in teens. Could this be related to hormones? So yes, I, I do believe that there's a correlation. So like light, um, milestone markers for like life, like puberty or even, you know, being born, um, pregnancy, um, getting your period, like those markers or milestones can bring on changes in hormones and uh, could trigger epilepsy. And um, a lot of the research says that it could be you know, a hormonal shift. So we, like I mentioned, um, so in puberty, you know, you're, you're going from being pretty kind of like flatline hormone to having all of these new hormones. And so, you know, it could be a lack of uh, progesterone, for example. Um, it could also be a lack of um, nutrients as well. So things like, you know, sugar, glucose is really important. Minerals like magnesium and copper are really important. Um, vitamins like B6. Um, what else? Um, just the ability to create energy is also really important, which, you know, progesterone is also extremely important for that. So I'd be looking at sort of how the teen is living their life, um, the nutrients, and also trauma as well, because you can't really discount that and that could also have a lot to do with that so i'd be looking kind of at everything holistically hopefully what i mentioned gives you some new avenues to explore um i'm sorry that you know i'm not sure if you have epilepsy or someone you care about has it but i hope that you guys figure out a solution for them very soon is clotting always bad the first two days of our cycles? Um, not necessarily. So it's really more about the size of the clots, like how big they are, how much. Um, if the clots are like, I think smaller than a quarter, um, then it's okay. It's pretty normal, common. Uh, but if you're like clotting really big clots and it's like excessive, um, then that's a sign that you have a lot of estrogen because um, estrogen is what builds up the uterine lining. And if we have too much estrogen in relation to progesterone, we're going to build it up more than we should um, necessarily. So uh, I'd be kind of looking at how big and how much to really contextualize if it's a problem. So hopefully that helps you figure some things out. Is 8.5 to 9.5 hemoglobin sufficient for excess blood loss after birth? Um, so this is kind of irrelevant because, or this hemoglobin in this context in terms of like excess blood loss, um, because you need copper to create uh, new blood cells, red blood cells. So the entire production of red blood cells is regulated by copper. And so if we don't have enough copper, we're not going to be able to make enough new red blood cells. Um, so it doesn't matter what the hemoglobin levels is are hemoglobin levels are, we should be asking ourselves, what are our copper levels? So this is why I focus so much on the full Monty Iron Panel with preconception clients is because it's really important to determine whether or not we have enough copper and bioavailable copper to regulate all of this stuff that's happening during pregnancy um, to really account for what could potentially happen. Of course, like conventional midwifery or medicine if they see hemoglobin levels drop below like 12, they're going to suggest iron therapy, but this is so asinine in my opinion because it's not solving the issue of the copper deficiency that's causing the hemoglobin levels to be low. Your hemoglobin could be five, it could be seven, it could be 12, it could be 15, it doesn't matter. But if you don't have enough copper to replenish, help, help you create a new red blood cells, uh, after a loss of blood, then, you know, you can take all the iron you want. And yeah, hemoglobin levels may look good on the test, but if you actually can't create new red blood cells, then what's the point? You're going to have a problem. So um, some food for thought. I know that was a lot, but uh, hope that helps answer your question. 
I heard fish oil is good for period cramps. What would be a poofer free alternative to lower prostaglandins? Um, so vitamin E is an excellent way to combat prostaglandins. Uh, fish oil is not necessarily going to help you combat them. Um, so vitamin E all the way. Find a high quality one. I like MitoLife. Um, don't forget guys, I have a code. I never talk about this, but you don't have to pay full price for any MitoLife supplements. You can get 15% off with my code and that's innate. Having painful ovulation with gallbladder attacks, is that from excess estrogen? Um, great question, it sure sounds like it. So I would be focusing on um, reducing estrogen levels in my follicular phase and really throughout my whole cycle. So why do I have more um, estrogen during this phase before ovulation or at ovulation? Um, am I you know, coming in contact with too many xenoestrogens? Am I stressed? That's gonna increase estrogen. Uh, do I eat too many phytoestrogens? So looking at it holistically, look through my posts on estrogen dominance, endometriosis, even though, you know, they're not necessarily like, <laughs> you're not necessarily asking about that, but um, that will help um, you figure out the kind of sources of estrogens that you could potentially minimize. And hopefully that helps you with your um, middle schmers. What causes keratosis pilaris? So those are the small bumps on the backs of the arms. Um, so I, I've seen this really improve with uh, retinol, increasing retinol. So real vitamin A from animal foods, not like beta carotene, real vitamin A, um, increasing sunlight exposure. So vitamin D as well. That's super important for this. Um, also getting hold of any digestive issues because it usually stems from nutrient deficiencies, and also digestion. I feel like they really go hand in hand with this issue. Um, so what are your digestive issues? Do you have a gluten sensitivity? Are you sensitive to other things? Uh, why is that? Do you have bacterial overgrowth? Um, you know, leaky gut, whatever. Uh, basically, like, st digestive issues really stem from stress itself. So finding out what is this, what are the stressing factors and really attacking it from all angles. Does dairy really cause acne or is it a deeper issue? Um, so dairy does not cause acne. It is definitely a deeper issue. And if you look at any of the studies that, um, you know, show that or kind of insinuate that dairy causes acne, they're really biased, they're sponsored. It's not, it's not a clean. <laughs> um, so dairy can actually be really supportive. It has a lot of fat soluble vitamins that the skin needs to flourish, a lot of minerals as well. Um, so if we are reacting with acne, you know, with acne um, to dairy, um, it stems from an internal issue. We probably don't have the digestive capacity to digest the lactose in dairy well. Um, so really looking at that and why we are having that issue is really important. And yeah, we may have a sensitivity to, let's say, cows or goats, whatever the dairy is coming from, the animal. Uh, but it's not dairy itself. It's, you know, it's really an internal issue. Hyperadrenals in seven-year-old girl, higher testosterone, any ideas? Um, so yeah, there's a couple things I'd look at. One is, um, ha what is her environment like? How stressed is she? Because right now is actually a very stressful time and we like whether or not we'd like to believe it, it's going to impact our health. And it's also, our children are very um, sensitive to what's going on. You know, they may not seem like it, but the whole world has been shut down and they're probably not seeing their friends as often and not being able to do the things that they love to do very often. That could be a source of stress. Um, to, uh, trauma as well. Uh, when she was younger or, you know, recent, um, I'd also be looking that, at that. So maybe some kind of therapy to check out uh, would be helpful. Um, I'd also be looking at her blood sugar balance because that can be also a driver of um, adrenal output. So uh, how often is she eating? Is she eating balanced meals, protein and carb? Of course, we don't want to over-engineer a child's diet, but, you know, making sure they're eating in a balanced way um, will really help. And making sure she's getting enough minerals as well, that's super important. Um, so those are kind of like the top things I would probably pursue first. And uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you some avenues to explore. Are rennet and vegetarian enzymes okay additives to eat in raw organic cheese? So rennet comes from a calf, uh, but vegetarian enzymes usually are 
that usually is like a microbial kind of like fungus or mold, um, which can be fine. Like we, you know, have evolved coexisting with mold and fungus. Um, but if you're reacting to it uh, because of that, uh, you know, those enzymes, then maybe look for cheese without it. Can opium oatmeal be pro-metabolic um so yeah i don't see why it couldn't be as long as it works for you so is it properly prepared is it sprouted um is it um can opium oatmeal be pro-metabolic um so yeah i don't see why it couldn't be as long as it works for you so is it properly prepared is it sprouted um is it um leaving your temperatures and pulses in a very warm place. Uh, how does it make you feel? So I'd be looking at all of those things to see if it actually works for me. And you know, that's kind of how I decide if it's pro-metabolic. Um, it doesn't necessarily, pro-metabolic isn't, like there's no like set foods. If it worked for you, then it's pro-metabolic for you. Um, so hopefully, um, you're not restricting foods either that could potentially be working for you just because somebody says that they're not pro-metabolic, but just some food or thought. Best tips to heal histamine intolerance. So I've done a couple of posts on this. I would check out my highlights called allergies or my highlight called allergies. Um, it's usually a mineral deficiency, nutrient deficiency, and an estrogen issue kind of all in like one perfect storm. Um, so I would definitely work on making sure you're getting enough of those nutrients like copper, uh, making sure you're, you're reducing estrogen exposure because histamine and estrogen can potentiate each other. Um, and really it can take some time and it's, can be really annoying depending on how extreme your histamine intolerance is, but it can be done. I've done it myself. Early graying started at 25, believe iron supplements are the cause, possible to reverse. Um, so yeah, it is possible. I've seen it uh, in some of my clients and I've also seen it in some of the, um, the community for the root cause protocol for which I'm a consultant, um, just like complete reversal of, of gray hair. Um, you need to make sure you're getting enough copper. So I would check out the post I have that's titled, um, why am I getting gray hair? And it really stems from um, kind of like a tyrosinase deficiency, um, which is a copper enzyme. And so that kind of regulates our skin pigment, our hair pigment, and um, getting that enough of that, as well as the other cofactors for copper as well, are really going to make a huge difference. So go check out that post and uh, good luck. Is vitamin K2 necessary to absorb supplemental vitamin D? Um, so vitamin K is definitely very important for regulating, uh, making sure calcium gets where it needs to go. Um, in terms of whether it's necessary to absorb supplemental vitamin D, uh, no, they don't have that relationship. Um, also, this person who's asking this question probably hasn't been around long enough to know that I absolutely do not recommend vitamin D supplements. So whoever you are, I would highly recommend checking out my highlight titled Hormone D to understand why we don't need to be taking supplemental vitamin D. I want to eat raw dairy, meat, and eggs, but they literally sound terrible. It's my first trimester. Um, so yeah, food aversions can be a real thing. Um, you know, it's it sucks. I'm sorry to hear that, but congratulations also. Um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes the foods that we're most averse to actually eating them can make us feel better. Um, but not so much for some other people. So it really depends on you. Um, if you really are averse to these foods, I would just be making sure you're getting these nutrients from other foods, um, whether that's supplementally or, um, and like not synthetic supplementally, it has to be smart, so I would work with a one-on-one -on -one practitioner because um, you can really mess yourself up with supplements, especially in this phase. But um, I would just not worry about it and eat what you can and eat what you are craving and can stomach um, because you still need nutrition and you still need to eat. So that's what I would recommend. 
How to prevent solve major constipation problems during first trimester. Um, so constipation is a metabolic issue. So if you're trying to solve or prevent it, you need to focus on your metabolism. Um, so usually if we're entering um, pregnancy and that constipation begins, it's likely our metabolism wasn't in a very good state prior to conception. Um, so what I would recommend would be the same thing whether or not you're pregnant, um, and that would be to get your metabolism up, make sure you're detoxifying estrogen properly. So we're not talking about detox protocols here. We're talking about maybe having a raw carrot um, or bamboo shoots every day, um, keeping your blood sugar stable, and really making sure you're getting nutrient-dense and mineral-rich foods, um, and uh, lowering stress. And those are gonna be your metabolic boosting things that really help you go to the bathroom. Um, so hopefully those things help uh, at least a little bit. One more thing I should say, um, there's a level of, you know, wackiness that can happen when we're pregnant. Um, so there's sometimes there's only so much we can do, but that is why preconception prep is so important. It's because, you know, having excess estrogen while pregnant or in the preconception phase our hormones impact our child's health. We imprint our hormonal health on our children. So really making sure we're not in an estrogen dominant state going into pregnancy and that pregnancy doesn't become an estrogen dominant state. Although, you know, our estrogen is very high during pregnancy, but I mean like more than usual um, is really important too, not only for just constipation, but our baby's health. So it's kind of really important to get down to uh, the reasons that are driving the constipation so that you can have not only a smoother pregnancy, but it also doesn't impact the, chi the child's health. So just some food for thought. Is it true your body can build back its ability to make lactase? Uh, yeah, I talked about this a little bit earlier in the Q&A. Um, you need certain cofactors. Um, you really need to have a less stressed and distressed digestive system. That's really the most effective thing that has helped with my clients getting their um, dairy tolerance back. Um, so I would go check back earlier in my Q&A. Um, um, I'll also be doing a post on this eventually. Um, but yeah, good luck. If you can't find grass-fed raw milk, what's the criteria for the next best option? Um, so yeah, I did a post on this. I would look for my post titled like eat this, not that, or drink this, not that. It's like a milk version um, with a couple of milk jugs on it. So I always try to go for non-fortified. That's my number one. So a lot of milks here in the United States are fortified with synthetic vitamin D and synthetic vitamin A. So if I can find a brand without it, and it's usually the whole fat version, a whole milk version, that's going to have not have the, these um, because low lower fat milks, any kind of lower fat, it's legally required to add um, those synthetic vitamins to. Um, then I look for non-homogenized and um, yeah, I those are kind of like the criteria. Um, but uh, hopefully this helps you find a good option for yourself. How to incorporate bee pollen and how does it taste? Um, so I cannot give you any personal recommendations, but I can tell you what I do. Um, so I like to sprinkle it on my yogurt um, or like on a piece of fruit um, and usually it kind of like melts into whatever I'm sprinkling it on. Um, it tastes pretty like sweet. Um, I don't really know how to describe it. It's like a little floral a little sweet um, and it's really yummy it's got a lot of B vitamins um, and I just eat it every day or every other day on whatever I feel like uh, but it's important to determine whether or not you're gonna react to it um, so it's important to start small and um, Make sure you don't have any kind of bee product allergy. So like if honey is not an option for you, then you might not be able to do it. But um, just, you know, start with caution, I would say. But it's really great. What is chlorophyll good for? So I actually wrote a little bit about this in the free cycle literacy guide that myself and the preconception PT released earlier this week. So go check out the link in my bio if you don't have it yet. Um, but chlorophyll is a great binder. Um, it also contains copper. So, you know, it's a great source of minerals and it helps detoxify the body in a very gentle, gentle way. Um, so that's why I really like it. 
what are some body hair oral hygiene products you like? Um, so I could probably talk about this for a while, but um, let's see. I, uh, for my body and my skin, as a moisturizer, I like to use uh, coconut oil on my body. Um, I also use shea butter sometimes. Um, and that's really just like look for organic, um, uh, an organic brand. I don't really like have a specific special brand that I use for that stuff. Um, but uh, face wise, I use a mixture of Cosma Beauty and um, Forever Healthy Hair um, and Sanitas, which is like a Colorado based brand. Um, so is Cosma actually, and uh, and then Cosa Rex as well. Hair wise, I'm actually like I got rid of my old stuff. I'm on the hunt for a new brand. I used to use a Cure, but it was like leaving my hair in a big dreadlock every time, and um, it was just not. It didn't make my hair look good at all. So. I'm trying out different products here and there. I'll let you know what I like. Um, and then a hygiene. So like I use the, I use like crystal deodorant. I've used it since I was 20. <laughs> um, and I also like, um, what's it called? I like uh, Dr. Bronner's toothpaste. I've been using that for such a long time. Um, it's fluoride free, it's great. I use his products or their products uh, for my body wash and stuff, um, for my hand soap too. And uh, yeah, hopefully that gives you some ideas. Any suggestions for nausea? I'm eating shortly after I wake and often, not prego. So yeah, nausea is usually related to excess estrogen. Um, it's usually a gallbladder issue. They're both very connected. Um, it could also be a stomach acid issue, like do you have enough of the cofactors to produce stomach acid? So it's really overall like a nutritional and metabolic issue. Um, I would look at the, the post titled The Truth About Stomach Acid, or sorry, The Truth About Heartburn, um, that has some ideas on how to boost your stomach acid. And then, you know, if it doesn't disappear, uh, then you probably need a little bit more metabolic work. And that's probably when working one-on-one -on -one with somebody would definitely help. Is every nail polish toxic? I like to have my nails done, but I don't want to poison my body. Um, so girl, I feel you. I little do most people know I actually used to work for a beauty company and I had my own bi-weekly nail series. So I got to try out a lot of nail polishes and I review brands and, um, I used to be really good at doing nail art, which is a fun fact. Um, so there's no perfect nail polish, but I do love this one brand and it's called Zoya. I'll write it on the screen. Um, and their nail polish is so good. It's so good. And it's pretty, um, it's pretty clean in regards to like, other nail polish brands and um, I really like them a lot. It's high quality, the colors are beautiful, so I would check them out. Why do we crave ice? I did while pregnant, blood peak. Is it really a sign of low iron? Um, not really. Uh, it can be a couple things and like it's important to be aware of when you crave it. So like, do you crave it when you're hot? Do you crave it when you're nauseous? Um, do you crave it when you have heartburn? Because these could all be reasons you crave ice. It's really iron cravings don't really have much to do with it. There's no way for me to get oysters. Is beef liver enough to get all the nutrients? Um, so beef liver will definitely cover a lot of bases. I would still try to get oysters. Um, there does exist oyster, desiccated oyster. I personally have been taking it for a couple of months. Um, and there's a couple of brands, but, uh, very few actually, but, uh, Mito Life just came out with a new desiccated oyster supplement. I think they sold out the first day, but they might have more. Um, I don't personally use that brand. I use a different one, but it might be a good idea to just like keep an eye out for that one because the one I get is from overseas and, um, it can be quite expensive in terms of like shipping and all that stuff. So 
MitoLife and use the code INNATE to get 15% off. You don't have to pay full price. Um, that's kind of like a nice thing to have in your toolbox if you don't have uh, access. What's your take on Epsom salt baths? I think they're great. They're a great way to get topical magnesium. We used to bathe in magnesium rich water. I would prefer uh, magnesium chloride flakes, but my, um, Epsom salts are fine. Best vitamin C to take, supplements you recommend. Um, so I like to get vitamin C from Whole Foods. That's just what I do. I don't have any supplements in my cabinet. Um, but there are some people that have, are sensitive to fruit and stuff. So you could do a whole food vitamin C supplement. Um, just make sure it's, it says whole food. And I have a couple, I think, on my website in the approved product section. So check that out for a couple of options. How much coconut water should I drink to rehydrate my cells along with salt? Um, so if your only potassium source is uh, coconut water, you're going to have to drink a lot of coconut water, so you need to be getting potassium from other sources. Um, I'm going to be doing a post on potassium soon, I think, but um, yeah, coconut water is not sufficient. You need to really try to get potassium from other sources, so um, that's a lot of fruit usually, uh, so make sure you're getting that too. Um, cause if we're super depleted in potassium too, we're going to need to really try hard to get a lot of it. I'm anemic and my doctor insists I take an iron supplement, but I stopped. Should I supplement copper now? Um, I can't tell you what to take or not to take, but I can tell you that a copper supplement is not going to fix the problem. Um, so I'd go through my highlights titled iron and copper, and that should really help, um, kind of give you an idea of what you need to do um, because copper supplementation is usually also never the answer either uh, versus iron supplementation is usually the never the answer um, so I would uh, check that out first and then make it an informed decision do your own research and even bring some stuff to your doctor pro metabolic for four months and my joints are hurting now carnivore and keto prior um, so there's no question here but uh, uh, why is this happening? Um, probably because it's the true state of your system is now being shown. Um, carnivore and keto will suppress any kind of inflammation due to the stress hormones that you know you have to create to create blood sugar. Um, so when we start to really reduce the stress, reduce the stress hormones that we're forcing our body to pump out, um, we the true state of the system is actually revealed. And yeah, you might actually feel worse than you did when you were on these restrictive metabolic suppressing diets. But now your job is to really focus on the cause of the inflammation and nourish yourself so that your body has the kind of tools it needs to repair itself and actually set yourself up for metabolic success. What vitamin D supplement do you recommend? Do you recommend fasting for women? My morning temps are 96 to 97 degrees usually. Is this bad? Um, it's not bad, nothing is bad, but it's not optimal. Um, so your, you know, your temperature shouldn't be no lower than 97.8 to 98.6. So it just shows that your metabolism is lower than it should be. And um, you know, depending on where you're coming from, depending on what you're doing right now, there's probably more work to be done. How do I know when I'm fertile by taking my temperature every morning? Um, so fertility, you, ha you have to create fertility awareness. And so really honing in on when you ovulate, um, what the signs are will really help you figure out whether or not you are fertile. Um, so temperature plays a role, uh, but also cervical mucus and cervix height will also play a role. Um, your temperature will rise in the second half of your cycle once you ovulate, um, but Oftentimes, actually, when you're fertile, um, you may see your temperature dip because it's a couple of days before you ovulate and um, your temperature will spike after you ovulate. So kind of paying attention to the biomarkers, paying attention to the sort of um, patterns your own body creates is really important. There's no like one surefire way. So 
I know that it might be frustrating that I can't give you like a super straight answer. Um, and that, but that's kind of the beauty of taking charge of our own body and our fertility and creating awareness of our own cycle is like, there's, you know, there's no app that can tell you exactly when it's going to happen. There's no, um, a pill that you can take that will tell you exactly when it's going to happen. It's you need to become your own best expert. Um, that's kind of the most amazing thing about it. Um, while it can be the most frustrating, but um, it's really up to us. So, you know, get familiar with your body, um, have fun with it. I will be talking more about this in the course coming out exactly like how to tell when you're fertile and how to determine your ovulation window, but um, more to come there in the future. When will your course be out? Um, so the preconception PT and I are working really hard on the course. Thanks for your interest. Um, likely, you know, it's, it's become a lot bigger and we want to include so much stuff that it's going to likely come out in the new year. Uh, maybe February is kind of what we're thinking. Um, so make sure you're signed up um, on our mailing list um, in the link in my bio to make sure that you um, get notified as soon as we are able to release more information about it. That's kind of how we're going to update people on what's happening and like the latest. Uh, so make sure you're signed up there. Poofa free for one year and skin still turns splotchy in the sun, reason solutions. Um, so yeah, splotchiness, um, also like age pigment um, discoloration. It's not just PUFAs, but it's iron and estrogen, and estrogen increases iron absorption. So I would also be making sure, like, not just, um, it's not just about removing PUFAs or, like, minimizing PUFAs, because there's no way you can remove them fully, um, but also, like, what is your estrogen level like? Because that also increases um, iron uh, absorption, and estrogen can also cause, like, the vasodilation as well. So checking those out would be a good place to start. Can stress cause me to skip a period? Two tests say not pregnant. This has never happened. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry. This is probably disappointing if you are trying. But yes, yeah, stress can absolutely make you skip your period. And if that happens, that's a serious sign that your body does not feel safe enough to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So if this continues, I would definitely look into really like what are my stressors? What's been happening over the past couple months? Am I fueling myself properly? And really try to figure it out. Um, because if it doesn't come back, then that's, there's probably a deeper issue happening. Um, otherwise though, sometimes this can happen, uh, randomly. Um, it's still a sign that, you know, our body's undergoing a lot of serious stress, but, um, I would be more worried if it doesn't come back, your period doesn't come back. So hopefully that gives you some reassurance and some ideas to explore if it doesn't or if it does. Thoughts on supplementing vitamin K? Um, I really like vitamin K. I like vitamin K2 specifically. Um, but, you know, I would just make sure there are no contraindications with your medications if you are on any. Um, so check with your doctor before you start supplementing anything. But I do definitely like it, and it's definitely a really important nutrient, especially if you're trying to conceive. Um, it's really important for fetal development as well. So it gets an A plus from me. Can you have a period without ovulation? Uh, yes, 100%. This was me for a year and a half after getting off the birth control pill. I was not ovulating, but I had my period and um, my cycles were really long and I wasn't making any progesterone and it was really, really crappy, uh, but I still got my period. Um, so, you know, your body has to feel safe enough to ovulate and uh, repro to feel safe enough to reproduce. So you can absolutely have this happen. I'm going to do a post on it next week, so stay tuned. How long would you recommend someone wait before conceiving after being vegan? Um, I would actually wait at least two to three years, if not more, to replenish because if you're going from a vegan diet to trying to conceive, one, you may have difficulty, but two, you're not going to have the essential nutrients to build another human properly. Um, uh, so I would definitely take some time to replenish. You need fat-soluble vitamins. You need protein, like real protein, bioavailable protein from something with eyes. 
Um, you need uh, a lot of animal fats as well, saturated fats, cholesterol. Um, so all of this is going to take some time to rebuild. And your body's going to need some time to come out of its survival state because it probably is in a survival state. Um, so that said, it's frustrating to probably have a lot of time added to your timeline, but it's definitely worth it. So those are just my thoughts. Do you think the RCP shouldn't promote low carb? Um, so the RCP can do whatever it wants. Uh, I love the RCP. I think they've helped a lot of people. They've helped me. Um, but over there, it's all about minerals and it's really a mineral first focus. Um, so nutrition and nutrition strategy is not really a thing um, that RCPs are trained on. Um, this is why I really like um, having had my nutritional therapy background and having done so much extra research um, independent research myself to really understand human physiology. Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that's missed is human beings thrive off aerobic metabolism. And if we're not, um, if we don't have this kind of metabolism, we're creating oxidants like lactate and lactic acid. And that's not, a, a, it's a kind of like a different metabolism that's not supportive to overall uh, thriving function. We need to be able to burn glucose properly and efficiently to have an efficient metabolism. Um, so, you know, that said, I <laughs> it doesn't mean I can't work with the people there. It doesn't mean that we don't agree. Uh, I, I love differing points of view because the challenge is you to learn and investigate. Um, but I've learned for myself and I've sort of come to my own informed conclusions that I think carbs are essential to uh, um, thriving and, and having a great metabolism and being overall healthy. Um, that's not to say like Morley and I chat pretty frequently and I do put seeds in his ears here and there. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the beauty. We learn from each other and we're constantly learning because when we stop learning, we die. So some food for thought. Favorite apps for tracking your cycle? Um, so yeah, I like Flow and Clue, but remember to take those with a grain of salt because there's nothing better than actually being able to understand your own biomarkers because sometimes those are actually inaccurate. Um, so really understand your body and use them as a tool, uh, the apps as a tool, but um, don't take them as like uh, exact calculations because our bodies don't operate off of algorithms. Thrombophilia in pregnancy could be due to excess estrogen. Um, so yeah, excess estrogen is definitely at play. Fibrin, um, hypothyroidism. Um, so these kind of create a perfect storm. Um, they potentiate each other and they can create a lot of problems. So really getting your estrogen in check prior to pregnancy is really going to help prevent um, the, these kinds of issues from happening as well as your thyroid function, your metabolic function. Cause of ovulation bleeding. Um, so yeah, this can happen. Um, it is, it can be maybe normal for some people, but most of the time it's really uh, progesterone deficiency and estrogen is too high in relation to progesterone. And so it causes spotting, mid ovulation or mid cycle spotting, ovulation spotting. Um, it could also have to do with thyroid function. Um, if our thyroid function isn't there, we can also have mid cycle spotting. Um, so I would really wonder if this is like something that's been happening your whole life or if this just started happening because if it did just start happening, I'd wanna see if it continues because if it does continue, then it's probably a problem. Um, so hopefully that gives you some ideas. Um, I would say nothing to be super alarmed about until if it happens again in your next cycle. Okay, everyone, hopefully you find this Q&A helpful. I'll have one next week again as well. Um, and yeah, stay tuned for a few stories from me, one about a prenatal review and maybe some others. Maybe I'll throw in a quiz this week too.